Osteoporosis is a metabolic bone disease and that will cause porous bone appearance. Some would call that bone looks like Swiss cheese. What happens after that, then bone lost the mineralization, it also will lose the strand. So bone density is decreasing at this uh, time. Osteoporosis is a disease of multifactorial origin and uh, first of all age would affect age related bone loss will happen equally in men and women but uh, mostly women experiencing ne severe negative consequences of osteoporosis such as fractures and uh, risk for fracture in postmenopausal women are severely increased. Another option or another factor that can affect the development of osteoporosis is immobility. So if patient had for some reason decreased the activity level, they may experience osteoporosis, although they don't have any other factors that may contribute to it, such as age or, or female gender. When um, a woman becomes uh, estrogen deficient after menopause, it uh, may result in loss of density, inability to retain and absorb calcium and uh, osteoporosis. The recommendations of course will be not only introduce estrogen and introduction of estrogen as we know it's rather controversial at this point. So again the hormone therapy it's very controversial and we'll talk about it in the future but um, one of the safest recommendations will be to introduce exercise, weight-bearing exercise, which can slow the progression of the osteoporosis. So when osteoporosis occur, patient may have consequences related to compression vertebral fracture in the spine may occur and tiny wrist fracture. So compression fractures are common and because of the compression fractures in the spine and patient may have decrease in height and at the same time they may develop a, a hump Dauger's hump. So that's an abnormal curvature in upper thoracic spine. Again, wrist fractures may occur, and as the disease progresses, the most undesirable consequences of it, the risk for it increasing, and the most undesirable consequence is the fracture of the hip or a fracture of femur. Also patient may have very easily they may pr fracture the distal radius. Uh, the statistics about this rather overwhelming and they do not change much even with the introduction of the uh, medications uh, like Boniva and uh, Fosamox, they do not change much and approximately one million fractures a year may occur annually in the United States and I, uh, by one million fracture I mean hip fractures. Hip fractures will occur in older women, again frail, older and hip fracture may result in increased mortality. However, as I said before, advanced techniques of the 
hip replacement may result in gaining mobility back and uh, basically preserving that life and providing good quality of life. Treatment the, for osteoporosis is existing but treatment would not be reversing the osteoporosis completely. However, the treatment um, can level the bone mass and uh, can maintain adequate level of bone mass. So administration of, uh, again, medications such as Fosamax, Actinel, Boniva, and Reclast can be helpful. And uh, Reclast is actually in once a year injections, which is very uh, convenient for the patient. And the same is Boniva can be done once uh, every three months, and uh, Fosamax and Actinel can be done depending on the regimen daily or once a week. So the treatments certainly are existent, but they wouldn't really reverse the osteoporosis. They, they, they still prevent it from development. Of course, with osteoporosis treatment, also the consumption and adequate amount of calcium is important. So besides the calcium, we need to have adequate vitamin D intake and uh, also weight-bearing exercise routine. So swimming per se do not benefit osteoporosis prevention. Swimming is non-weight-bearing exercise, so it will be good for cardiovascular fitness, but as a mean to prevent osteoporosis, it will not be of such a benefit. Uh, estrogen, again, therapy may be a benefit, but it's controversial. It's uh, certainly there is a strong relation between breast cancer and uh, estrogen uh, therapy, hormone replacement therapy. So again um, and uh, we will talk about it more when we talk about hormone replacement therapy the decision should be made on case by case basis and the patient has be very very involved into making that decision and informed consent has utmost importance in this but um, to be on the safe side with all of this you certainly may recommend daily exercise, daily weight-bearing exercise to your patient. Also vitamin D, calcium, and uh, medications also may help, and uh, osteoporosis uh, can be controlled, and the result will be prevention of hip fracture, and the result will be reduction of related redu quality of life impairment and reduction in overall mortality. Let's look closer on postmenopausal osteoporosis and uh, I'd like to do that because this is one of the most common types of osteoporosis and postmenopausal women are much more commonly affected than uh, their male counterparts, the males of the same age. So to understand this, we need to realize or recall that serum androgens will affect bone density. The androgens cause bone um, density to increase. So androgens such as testosterone or dihydrotestosterone will stimulate bone formation. When we thinking about this, then it becomes somewhat paradoxical. Well, if we are talking about androgens, why 
decrease of estrogen is so concerning. In this case, there is a rather simple explanation. Decreased level of estrogen will cause increase in aromatase or aromatase, which is an enzyme that converts testosterone to estradiol. So if we have dropping estrogen, the patient also will develop increased level of aromatase and uh, testosterone will be aggressively converted to estradiol and which will result uh, losing the intensity of bone formation compared to a female who hasn't been exposed to significant amounts of aromatase. So another cause will be progesterone deficiency and progesterone deficiency uh, may be related to osteoporosis and this can be caused by changes in osteoprogerin which is an um, insulin type like growth factor and we have this short abbreviation IGF which is a combination of uh, in deficiency in osteoprogerin and deficiency of calcium intake, deficiency in vitamin D, magnesium is missing already, and not enough weight-bearing exercise. In addition to that, we have estrogen levels dropping, which will drain our androgens as well, and plus we shouldn't forget the important factor like family history. So all of this can work together and cause osteoporosis in postmenopausal female. To add to that, um, that another, there is another risk factor that can affect postmenopausal female, the excessive use of sodas. And sodas are uh, uh, like laced with phosphorus and they will interfere with calcium phosphorus balance and which will also result in osteoporosis. So to summarize, we have in this case, we have deficiency of testosterone, secondary to increase in aromatase, which is related to declining estrogen level and another cause the progesterone deficiency and progesterone deficiency is related to reduction uh, in osteoprogerin and uh, which is an insulin growth type factor in addition to that we have not enough calcium not enough vitamin d decreased magnesium not enough exercise and we also have excessive intake of phosphorus containing drinks or foods and all of this together will result in brittle bones but again don't forget that this all like food and uh, intake or um, dietary intake may not be the main uh, source of um, development for osteoporosis. This is a worldwide problem and it's certainly the one of the or the main causes for it. It's not dietary related but it's related to deficiency of androgens and deficiency of progesterone. But of course having not enough calcium, vitamin D, not enough exercise and drinking too much sodas definitely will make the situation even worse but again don't forget that the male person who does exactly the same may not develop osteoporosis at all osteomalacia is another interesting phenomenon and uh, when we observing a deficiency of vitamin D 
that may lower the absorption of calcium from the gut. Osteomalacia can be translated such as softening of the bone. So softening of the bone is a deficiency of calcium. So osteomalacia will happen if we don't have enough vitamin D, as I said. So vitamin D, certainly we need it to uh, facilitate the bone mineralization, which will give us structural integrity and hardness to the bone. So without, without appropriate mineralization or without, with delayed mineralization, bone formation will not advance. So when we're having bone formation, recalling from ANP, bone will progress to osteoid formation, but calcification will, uh, will not occur and the result will be soft bone. So vitamin D deficiency in an adult may be secondary to low nutritional intake and uh, or malabsorption problem. And this day and age in the United States, uh, it's rather difficult to have low vitamin D intake considering if the person that consumes milk and milk products because everything is fortified with vitamin D. But it's still there are people who are lactose intolerant or for one or the other reason they avoid milk or milk products. At the same time, we all hear that ultraviolet radiation uh, is certainly carcinogenic, so we do not have that benefit of sun rays to produce vitamin D. So this all results in osteomalacia. What will happen? So patient will have bone pain. At the same time, they may develop a small fracture, like bone fracture, compression fracture. Even it can get to the point that the patient may have vertebral collapse and bone malformation. So bones that have weight-bearing roles will be affected the most. They will show some deformity and those are the bones in the spine, vertebral bones, pelvic girdle, and bones in lower extremities. So patient will again have pain, bone fractures, uh, vertebral problems and malformation. Treatment will include the correction of deficiency of vitamin D and patient may be required uh, to consume significant amounts, approximately 200,000 international units weekly of vitamin D for month, month and a half. and. Uh, and then uh, it may be followed by uh, daily doses of vitamin D in the future. But uh, it usually works, but on the other hand, if there is some damage already done, like the bowing of the bones, shortening, flattening, this will not help. This will not help to regain, to return to baseline. So what to do, what to advise to your patient, how to avoid this easy sunlight, again, controversial, and I will make a disclaimer. So uh, please discuss with the patient the exposure to sunlight, excessive sunlight. Yeah, you and your patients need to know that, yes, the sun exposure, even minimal, can cause uh, bone, uh, um, I'm sorry, can cause uh, skin-related malignancies, and uh, that should be an informed decision right there. On the other hand, dietary intake of vitamin D is important. 
fish such as uh, salmon, eggs, like egg yolks, again egg yolks rich with cholesterol, again make an informed decision for your patient. And probably the safest way is ordering or taking supplements with vitamin D and uh, thankfully there are so many different types of vitamin D supplements on the market so you have lots of lots of different things. Paget disease is a relatively rare disorder. It's also known as osteitis deformance it's a chronic metabolic disorder and it affects bone formation excessive resorption of spongy bone and uh, it will also cause accelerated formation of softened bone so normally bone is broken down and replaced Osteoclasts, osteoblasts, they work together. So there's a constant rate of this that's going on. And the, we know that the process is called remodeling. But in Paget's disease, the overgrowth of new bone that outplaces the breakdown of old bone is different the new bone is thicker than the old but it's much more weaker and what which will increase the possibility of fracture so basically you are um, uh, changing the bone into something more spongy and more uh, brittle and at the same time the new structure is much thicker, but structurally not uh, so strong. When x-ray is done, it will reveal a mosaic bone pattern and every radiologist would tell you that it's a Paget's disease. Paget's disease will affect axial skeleton and it will affect basically pelvis and long bones of lower extremities and usually it occurs after age of 40 and it will become more common with advancing age. Um, thickened bone can cause abnormal bone shapes and uh, which can be cosmetic defect or functional defect but at the same time they may result in brain compression impairment of motor function they may also result in deafness atrophy of the optic nerve and uh, this all happened deafness for example uh, happens because there are bones in the ears although they are very small and uh, hearing will be certainly impaired. So secondary problems of the Paget disease is the development of osteosarcoma. Or of, so osteosarcomas will be more prevalent in the patient with Paget's disease. So again, the etiology of Paget's disease is uh, rather uh, unstudied. Uh, there are theories around there, but uh, I'd like to say that really, truly, this is an idiopathic source. Of, of course, there is a source, we just don't know about it, and there are different theories, but jury is still out there. But the point is that Paget disease like osteoporosis can be treated or at least patients may benefit from it if we introduce calcium and vitamin D supplementation.
Osteomyelitis is an infection of the bone. Most common causative organism is Staphylococcus. Staphylococcus infection is most commonly usually causing the osteomyelitis. Often when we look at it, it will come from the top, from the open wound and uh, we can call it exogenous uh, osteomyelitis, but also can be blood-borne, like endogenous. But uh, again, as any infection will result in acute and chronic inflammation, can cause constitutional symptoms such as uh, fever, weight loss, a patient may complain of severe pain, bone pain, and it may result without treatment in necrotic bone and basically continuing of the necrosis of the bone. So treatment is usual uh, for the infection, which may include antibiotics, debridement, uh, surgical removal of the affected bone and there's a rather new treatment of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Also a capsule releasing antibiotics may be placed surgically into a, a spot where or into a, a enclave where the osteomyelite is present which will be releasing antibiotics rather uh, constantly over several months. So this is a severe infection and this is, is very difficult to treat. So exogenous osteomyelitis is much more common and somewhat preventable or uh, it can occur with um, nosocomially with uh, as a consequence of uh, manipulation of the bone for surgeries as well as with the injections of the joints and uh, so again strict sterile technique is important any procedure is done but with bones it's becoming of utmost importance so the treatment w may be successful but it's very very long and very taxing for the patient Joint disease uh, can be inflammatory versus non-inflammatory and we can differentiate very easily, uh, at least in theory. Uh, it's difficult to look inside the synovial uh, ch capsule, but at least in theory we know that there is no absence, no uh, synovial membrane inflammation so it's non-inflammatory. If there are no systemic signs and symptoms, non-inflammatory. And synovial fluid analysis will come back normal. So inflammatory, it's more systemic, while non-inflammatory is more localized. Osteoarthritis is one of the degenerative joint diseases and Diseases of the joints as diseases of the bone result in severe immobility uh, and um, they may, the incidence of them may increase with age. Patient will require use of assistive devices and uh, quality of life will be impaired and uh, eventually patient may require assistance or placed into a skilled nursing facility. When osteoarthritis happen, it's uh, inflammation of the joint that uh, may result the, in uh, the loss of articular cartilage and uh, also formation of the bone spurs. At some point, every person probably had arthritis, and by arthritis we can have uh, 
any sprain joint or jammed finger or anything any inflammation or dislocated uh, joint uh, well, certainly will result in arthritis because arthritis is nothing but joint inflammation however osteoarthritis uh, or degenerative joint disease it's a process of wear and tear or wearing out of the joint and uh, most of the people actually has some degree of as osteoarthritis and the, the wear and tear of the joints starts in early adulthood and continues with age the etiology is unknown it's so-called primary disease which is really idiopathic which um, we can say that disease can have multifactorial character but um, again this is a wear and tear disease and uh, for instance having sports injuries will increase the incidence or onset of the disease with osteoarthritis the local areas of damage will occur and loss of cartilage will happen new bone would start forming at the joint margin its subchondrial bone changes will happen and patient will start developing malsinovitis and the thickening of joint capsule so patient will also will have muscle pain pressure its subchondrial bone will increase the capsule stretching causing bone and the ligaments will be straining and tendons will be straining and the uh, periosteum will be elevated so patient will have pain uh, stiffness uh, enlargement of the joint tenderness to touch mobility issues and deformity sometimes you will see severe osteoarthritis in the knee and size of knee significantly increased but again this is just idiopathic disease inflammatory joint disease again commonly called arthritis is somewhat different from osteoarthritis it's just that inflammatory damage and destruction of synovial membrane and cartilage or articular cartilage and has some systemic signs of inflammation at this time when patient will be experiencing fever uh, elevated white blood cell count malaise loss of appetite and this can be infectious or non-infectious in origin so if there is some type of inflammation of joint occurs with systemic changes so this may be just uh, inflammatory damage secondary to infection but again patient will have the symptoms of uh, osteoarthritis but at this point the disease isn't idiopathic and we can pinpoint the causative agent or the source of the symptoms rheumatoid arthritis is a separate disorder and it's a inflammatory joint disease it's a systemic autoimmune disease and autoimmune attack to self connective tissues and the attack occurs on the synovial membranes so patient will have most of the symptoms similar to osteoarthritis but there are some differences the difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis is how the joints are affected in the hands osteoarthritis and this kind of like rule of thumb is um, 
affecting the working joints in the hands and uh, by working joints in the hand I mean like primary and distal and proximal intraphalangeal joint and it will cause swelling and pain at the same time all joints in the hand can be affected in rheumatoid arthritis the patient with rheumatoid arthritis will have significant deformity and the patient will have a ulnar deviation which is a characteristic sign for the rheumatoid arthritis in osteoarthritis usually the small bones aren't affected that much and osteoarthritis is a big joint disease such as knees so lab results lab tests will be revealing for um, rheumatoid factors presence and um, also antibodies IgG and IgM uh, will be present when synovial fluid is aspirated it will be uh, significant for the presence of inflammatory exudate but again the rule of thumb or the rule is if small joints affected it's most likely rheumatoid arthritis big joints osteoarthritis symmetrical involvement both hands rheumatoid arthritis asymmetric one knee it's osteoarthritis so symmetrical rheumatoid asymmetric osteo historical evaluation for rheumatoid arthritis so this is a list which you can actually diagnose with and four of these should be present morning joint stiffness that will last at least one hour arthritis in three or more joint areas and arthritis in the hand joints symmetric arthritis rheumatoid nodules and rheumatoid nodules is subcutaneous nodules that present in the patient with rheumatoid arthritis elevation of rheumatoid factor in the blood test and again x-ray changes such as ulnar deviation or ulnar drift so patient's hands will be moving towards the uh, ulnar bone so their pinkies will be sticking out somewhat so these are four if four of these present that's diagnostically relevant to diagnose with rheumatoid arthritis but again uh, RF is a significant uh, uh, finding to diagnose someone with rheumatoid arthritis versus something like arthritis of the joints in the hands or uh, arthritis in the three or more joint areas so these are not so specific but RF will be more specific Ankylosing spondylitis, it's an uh, inflammatory joint disease that can cause stiffening and the fusion of the joints. Again, it's systemic and autoimmune character inflammatory disease. So what happens in this case, uh, inflammation in the spine or sacroiliac joints will be causing stiffening and fusion of the joint uh, so primary sites will be sites where ligaments tendons and the joint capsules are inside inserted into the bone and the site calls antesis so the primary site will be is always considered that the antesis is the primary site um, with this disease truly there is no known cause no certain cause for this 
but uh, there is association with HLA B27 antigen and and but again this is one of the diseases that the symptomatology and diagnostic evaluation is quite developed but etiology is still uh, not so well known patient in this situation in this condition will be having inflammation of fibrocartilage in uh, vertebral and sacroiliac joints and uh, when this happens inflammatory cells will start infiltrating and they will destroy or erode fibrocartilage and of course with the destruction we will attempt to repair this with repair unfortunately we will have scar tissue formation and scar tissue will ossify and calcify and joints eventually fuse so again these are the best efforts to repair and uh, protect but however what happens because of the ossification of the scar tissue this will cause joint fusion so again autoimmune inflammation of fibrocartilage and the invertebral and sacroiliac joint and uh, uh, eroding fibrocartilage is trying to heal but it leads to ossification and calcification so patient will have early symptoms of low back pain stiffness pain decreased mobility and uh, also you will see that lumbar curvature is lost patient will have somewhat flat back because of the fusion so another disorder that is very common is gout gout is a certainly metabolic disorder and um, it's a uric acid production or exertion uh, disorder impairment of production or exertion you can find high levels of uric acid in the blood or if you can test other body fluids it will be present there concentration of uric acid in gout is very high and what happen it is high enough that can crystallize and crystallization will result in deposits in connective tissues and uh, in connective tissues it's okay but when we're talking about connective tissue such as joints and synovial fluids the this will lead to inflammation such as uh, gouty arthritis or colloquially gout again uh, without going into too much details gout is related to purine metabolism and by purine we mean adenine and guanine metabolism and uh, people may have very rapid purine metabolism and breakdown and uh, which means uh, patient will synthesize too much purines and it will start breaking down on the other hand uh, this also may be caused by pu poor uric acid exertion by the kidneys so again uh, uh, at some point the concentration of uric acid will increase so much so it's time for crystals to deposit so the crystals will deposit in uh, uh, lower extremities and uh, which will cause gouty arthritis and uh, the crystals usually deposit in metatarsophalangeal joint so basically in big toe uh, 
one of the points here that uric acid crystals are very well formed and we know if crystal is formed the edges of the crystals are very sharp and they have ability to irritate and damage the joint and this will cause inflammatory response uh, you may notice in observation of metatarsal uh, phalangeal joint that uh, actually there is erythema, edema, and of course tenderness to touch. Patient will also have symptoms of deposits of uric acid crystals in other places with connective tissues and especially very well-known phenomenon is deposits of crystals in the cartilage of the ears or so-called toffees. Um, when we're talking about clinical stages of gout, again, to recapture what will happen, it's the symptoms of gout don't happen overnight, and patient will be in a relatively long period of asymptomatic hyperuricemia, and uh, when the concentration is... Uh, significant for crystal deposits, the crystal deposits will start uh, depositing in the joint and at that time uh, also inflammatory response will occur. So toffee can again deposit in any type of connective tissue such as ear cartilage or in metatarsophalangeal joint. So this is schematically represents what happened with the urine, uh, 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 I'm sorry, with the uric acid crystals and uh, there is attempt for phagocytosis by a leukocyte and uh, eventually uh, the crystal will be exerted from phagolysosome and the uh, leukocyte will be disturbed as well. But after that, the resulting crystal will cause inflammation. Fibromyalgia is interesting uh, disorder and it is one of the overly misdiagnosed or overdiagnosed disorder. A patient will present with vague, vague symptoms and uh, the symptoms include sensitivity to touch. There is no inflammation per se detectable by laboratory methods or observable. Uh, patient will have fatigue, sleep disturbances, and it's truly there are no objective factors that may confirm the presence of the disease. But fibromyalgia, it's a chronic widespread joint and muscle pain. But again, uh, as we've been told over and over, pain is what the patient report and that not that you think, but with fibromyalgia, there is no objective, uh, there is no objective uh, data that confirms the presence of the disease. And there have been discussed in the literature several possible factors, such as a viral illness, also chronic fatigue syndrome can be misdiagnosed as my fibromyalgia. Another the um, possible misdiagnosis can happen and it's all uh, more serious consequences. When flu-like viral illness or chronic fatigue disease, of course they are very uh, taxing, but patient has chances for recovery without interventions or with certain interventions that will work. But in case of HIV infection, 
or Lyme disease, there were cases that patients misdiagnosed with fibromyalgia, which delayed the actual treatment. Some medications like beta blockers may cause or the symptoms of fatigue or other medications like statins may cause uh, muscular tenderness or myalgias. Also physical and emotional trauma certainly may result in aches and pains. But overall there are no scientific studies that will clearly define the cause or etiology of fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia diagnosis, if diagnosed correctly, should be diagnosed based on this diagram. Patient has to express pain in these pressure points. So pain should be symmetrical and uh, pain should be present in most of these point, pressure point. But in reality, uh, when you find diagnosis of fibromyalgia in chart review, again, there is uh, no evidence even this examination has been carried out, but uh, basically based on the history and patient presentation without uh, carrying out the pressure point examination which is presented here, the patient may be diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is certainly inappropriate. Again, this is a disease of uh, based on history and diagnosis of the exclusion. If patient comes to you with unknown fatigue and unknown pains and aches, uh, try to see bigger picture and try to uh, proceed with more diagnosis studies and more background than just uh, proceeding with uh, diagnosis of fibromyalgia just because patient fits that type.